The hoodoo dance is shrouded in secrecy and has been mentioned in various accounts of the hoodoo tradition. It has remained one of the most closely guarded rituals, known for its intense and often ominous practices that tap into the collective power of the community and beckon unseen forces. Zora Neale Hurston provides insights through Ruth Mason, a notable practitioner in New Orleans, whom she apprenticed with in 1928. Despite Ruth's affliction of neuritis, Zora acted as a stand-in during one of these hoodoo dance rituals. Ruth Mason's narrative reveals the ritual's focused intent, specifically aimed at invoking death upon an enemy. We will also turn our attention to an anonymous spiritualist who was interviewed by Harry Middleton Hyatt, anthropologist and author of Hoodoo, Conjuration, Witchcraft, and Root Work. In contrast, the informant's account presents the Hoodoo dance as a multifaceted event that blended social and spiritual elements. The description, while less detailed, emphasizes the communal and dual nature of hoodoo dances, reflecting the multicultural heritage of New Orleans, where African, French, and Caribbean influences converge. Hey everyone, it's Papa Seer, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you love diving into captivating stories about hoodoo history, Black American spirituality, and so much more, then you're in the right place. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel so you'll be the first to know whenever I post a new video. In 1928, Zora Neale Hurston had the extraordinary opportunity to witness and participate in a hoodoo dance under the guidance of Ruth Mason in New Orleans. Zora does not provide her audience with the backstory of Ruth Mason, other than she was Catholic and well known for her work during this time in New Orleans. According to Zora, this dance was not a celebration, but a solemn ceremony with a specific and grave purpose to bring about the death of an enemy. Due to the illegality of hoodoo practices at this time, traditional drumming was eliminated to maintain secrecy and avoid law enforcement. Instead, the participants substituted the drumming with hand clapping and foot padding to create the necessary rhythm for the ritual. Ruth scheduled the dance from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m choosing these hours for their correlation with bad luck and evil. The client agreed upon a fee of $100 for the ceremony to commence, which is roughly $2,000 in today's money. She also hired an additional five participants who were also skilled hoodoo practitioners. A table was set with offerings including cake, wine, roast duck, and barbecued goat, which were consumed by the participants before the ceremony began. At precisely 10 a.m., Ruth mounted a wooden statue which represented the spirit or angel of death on a black draped throne. This statue, a rudely carved bust, was placed on a box covered in black sateen. Ruth then carefully set a red crown on its head, signaling the start of the ritual. Zora wrote the name of her intended target on seven slips of paper, one for each participant. Following Ruth's instructions, she placed these slips into the statue's grinning mouth nine black candles prepared by bathing them in whiskey and bad vinegar were used. The participants bit off the butt ends of the candles and lit them, 
placing them on the altar, three on each side of death and three in front. They called upon death by chanting their secret incantations, accompanied by three snaps of the thumb and middle finger. The room remained silent until Ruth, visibly mounted by spirit, signaled the beginning of the dance. One of the participants rose drunkenly and began to dance, prompting the others to join in with light clapping. He circled the room and then prostrated himself before the altar, initiating the dance. The dance lasted for three hours, with liquor provided to sustain the participants. However, it was the intensity of the rhythm and atmosphere that truly kept them going more than the alcohol. Throughout the dance, participants continuously beseech death to follow the footsteps of their target. There was no set formula. Each person spoke to death in their own way. Their faces in violent movements reflecting their deep dedication to the ritual. Ruth ensured that a portion of all the food was placed before death, who remained on his throne until 1 a.m. After the ceremony, all the food was removed from the table and thrown into the Mississippi River, completing the ritual. It was believed that the person targeted by the dance would not live more than nine days after the ritual. However, for this particular target, results began to manifest in only five days. Through Zora's eyes, this hoodoo dance led by Ruth Mason was an intense and revealing experience. It also sheds light into the powerful and secretive world of hoodoo rituals. Now, let's delve deeper into the hoodoo culture of New Orleans through the memories of another informant. While Ruth's account emphasizes the ritualistic and seriousness of the hoodoo dance, this informant provides a contrasting yet complementary perspective, showcasing the multifaceted nature of the hoodoo tradition emphasizing the differences in practitioners. This interview was conducted by Harry Middleton Hyatt as a part of his immense anthropology series, Hoodoo, Conjuration, Witchcraft, and Root Work. This series features interviews with Hoodoo practitioners in the American South, offering information of firsthand accounts. Did they used to have those old hoodoo dances when you were a girl? Yes, sir. What did they used to do? Well, they would dance in their petticoat tails and their shimmy tails. Just dance. Did you ever hear of them dancing a person to death? Well, no. I never heard of that. So you're saying that they just had those dances for good times. The good time dance and they were going to do their work at the same time, but they were doing hoodoo work when they used to dance. Plenty to eat and plenty to drink and if anything was to harm, they would have hearts, raw hearts, and they would eat that. Hearts. What kind of hearts? Well, they were beef hearts. You know, the 24th day of June, you know that's St. John's Day, and that's also my day. At the lake, that's where they would hold the dance, the hoodoo dance. They dance, and they have a meeting, and anything that you would want to do, they do it that day. If it's good or bad, they do it that day. And anybody could go out there that wanted to go. They be singing and clapping their hands while singing, mostly saying, Marie Marlena, comme ci, comme ça. Just dancing and singing like that in French. And as they dance, they carry around these big switches. You know, just as if you were dancing on somebody. 
then they got the lights all burning. Yeah, they got all the lights burning, then they're dancing, and the night come in again, and then they will have a supper, you see? And then, they have these people's names all on every place. They got their names down on every place, written on the floor, just like here, they would be singing. And then, well, still in all, then they would go out. Then they'll come back and they'll go into the hall again, like they were dancing. See, that's on Thursday nights and Friday nights when they got the big meeting. And then they'll dance on somebody's heads, you know, meaning basically the names was chalked on the floor and they dance on top of that, you see. Then the next day, they will go out to their house and they'll have something that they had made and they'll throw it all around these people's houses. See something like make out their friend to you? Well, then they'll come to your house and they'll throw that. And put you in the worst luck they can. And there ain't nowhere you can go. Now that's about all I can remember see. Because when they had these hoodoo dances. I want nothing but a little girl back then. As we explore these narratives. It's interesting to observe the differences. Between Ruth Mason's ritualistic experiences. And the more varied accounts from the informant. These perspectives highlight the differences in practices within the Hoodoo tradition and reflect the cultural influence of New Orleans. Ruth Mason's description focuses on a ritual with a very specific purpose, bringing death to an enemy. The dance is not for pleasure, but a ceremonial act with an intense objective. In contrast, the informant from New Orleans presents a broader perspective on hoodoo dances. While these dances involved hoodoo work, they were also social events with plenty of food and drink, blending leisure and ritual. The intent could range from benign to harmful activities, suggesting a more diverse application of the rituals. Ruth Mason provides a detailed account of the ritual actions, including sticking slips of paper with the enemy's name into the mouth of the carved statue of death, dressing candles and setting them in a specific arrangement. In contrast, the informant from New Orleans offers a less detailed description of specific actions, mentioning general activities like dancing with big switches lighting candles, and singing in French. The focus is more on the overall atmosphere and sequence of events rather than precise ritual acts. New Orleans is known for its vibrant culture, blending celebration with traditions as seen in events like Mardi Gras. The informant's description of hoodoo dances as social events aligns with this cultural backdrop, reflecting the city's tradition of mixing the sacred with the festive. The influence of French, African, and Caribbean heritage are evident in practices like singing in French, using candles, and rhythmic dancing. Additionally, the emphasis on St. John's Day highlights the syncretism and New Orleans culture, where Catholic and African American traditions emerge, showcasing the city's unique blend of customs. While the differences between Ruth Mason's detailed rituals and the broader descriptions from our New Orleans informant are evident, it's also important to recognize the similarities that unite these accounts. Both perspectives reveal common elements that highlight the core aspects of the hoodoo dance, reflecting shared traditions and practices. Both accounts highlight the hoodoo dance is performed with a specific purpose in mind, serving both good and malevolent purposes. Ruth Mason's account shows the dance darker intent, serving as bringing harm to an enemy while the informant from New Orleans describes a broader range of intentions, 
Both descriptions mention plenty of food and drink, the use of candles, and vigorous dancing. Ruth Mason details a furious rhythm sustained by liquor, whereas the informant describes dancing in petticoat and shimmy tails, sometimes carrying big switches. Offerings were made to spiritual entities in both accounts. While Mason details offerings to the Statue of Death and the informant mentioning ritualistic items thrown around people's homes, spoken elements and significant dates are also common, with Ruth Mason describing a dance from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on a chosen date and the informant mentioning the 24th of June, St. John's Day. In closing, the accounts of Ruth Mason and the informant from New Orleans offer glimpses into one of Hoodoo's most guarded secrets, the Hoodoo Dance. Despite varying details, both narratives highlight how the dance serves both the communal celebration and a spiritual invocation. These rituals, shaped by the culture of New Orleans, reinforce interplay between the sacred and the social. Thanks for watching. If you found these stories as fascinating as I did, give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends or respective communities. I'd love to hear your thoughts or other fascinating people or subjects you would like me to cover. So let's get the conversation started in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe to Papa Seer for more intriguing stories from history. And I'll see you in the next video.